Hello and thanks for taking the time to watch this video about the Holy Spirit and specifically about the gifts of the Spirit. I believe this is one of the most misunderstood and unfortunately misused and even ignored areas of Scripture. I also believe that we need to have a clear understanding of the gifts of the Spirit because they're incredibly valuable and absolutely necessary in the life of the believer, especially in today's world. And to make it through this life, we need to carefully carry the Spirit of God within us. And the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's a person, the third member of the Godhead, or what theologians call the Trinity. In fact, our church here in All Good Tennessee was named after this simple yet complex theological principle because it emphasizes the necessity of the Holy Spirit to still be at work in our lives today. There were many, many prophecies in the Bible concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit, including the words of Jesus himself. He said in John chapter 15, verse 26, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father. And then on the day of Pentecost, it happened. The Holy Spirit came to indwell and to empower believers. And that particular day was the beginning of a traditional Jewish holiday called the Feast of the Harvest. It was a nationwide celebration that the harvest had begun, that their hard work for so many months had finally produced fruit. And what they had sowed, they were now able to reap. So the harvest was ready, but they needed continued strength to bring in the harvest. It was gonna take a lot of work, but they paused to celebrate before the harvesting actually began. So Jesus used this upcoming celebration to speak to the disciples using a spiritual correlation, a metaphor with a purpose. He said in Luke chapter 10, verse two, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. And he was talking about souls, people who were ready to accept Jesus as their savior. So to give the believers the strength to bring in the harvest, God sent the Holy Spirit to empower believers to be workers in God's harvest field, in his kingdom. The Bible says in Acts chapter two, that on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, let's get some context for Acts 2 and what was going on during that time. The early church didn't yet have the New Testament for direction and guidance. They relied on the apostles' teaching and the Holy Spirit's instruction. They experienced demonstrations of God's power, miracles, healings, and salvations. They experienced the fivefold ministry in operation and the gifts of the Spirit were being used everywhere, not just in church, but also in homes and in the marketplace. But then something happened gradually over time. After the Bible was completed, Christians came to rely more on their knowledge alone than they did the power of God. And some people actually began to teach, and those teachings still exist in some churches today, that because we now have the finished Word of God, the Bible, that we no longer need the power of God. And unfortunately, many Christians live their lives never knowing the full fellowship and companionship and power of the Holy Spirit. And many churches are content to function without all the gifts of the Spirit in operation. And you may ask why? Well, the answer is simple. It's because it can get messy as people begin to grow in their maturity and understanding of the gifts of the Spirit. My answer is that it may be easier to keep your kids out of the pool than take the time to teach them how to swim. But so our position is that it's okay for things to get a little messy as we learn how to operate in the gifts just as long as we all remain teachable throughout the process. The Apostle Paul was convinced of this and he wrote that we need both the Word of God and the Spirit of God in our lives to be effective in our responsibility as Christians to reach the lost and make disciples. He said in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, that we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Note his choice of the word weapons. It's plural, meaning more than one. That's the power of the word and the power of the spirit. Unfortunately, far too many Christians lean on their own understanding and intellectual abilities. We don't consult the Holy Spirit like we should for His guidance in our lives because we assume we already know what He wants us to do. 
But when we don't depend on and yield to the Holy Spirit's leadership in our lives as the early church did, we miss many opportunities to see the Holy Spirit's power released in our lives. It's true that there is no substitute for the Word of God, for the true power of the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. But neither is there a substitute for the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. These two go together as one, because Jesus and the Spirit are one with the Father. We believe that if the Spirit's presence and power are removed from our lives, all that's left is ritual and religion. And religion, religious works, will never raise the dead, cast out demons, heal the sick, deliver the oppressed, or turn people to Jesus. So you might ask, what is the purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, the word power is actually the word dunamis. It's from the same origin we get the word dynamite. It means explosive power. And the word for the Holy Spirit is paraclete. It means our helper, our counselor, or our advocate. And the helper definition is about the power we need to be witnesses of Jesus, right? The power for sharing the gospel. And that's why Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we would be his witnesses, telling people about him everywhere. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit isn't just to benefit us, it's to benefit others as we share the good news of Jesus. Now let's talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Because in addition to the power of the Holy Spirit, we are also given gifts from the Holy Spirit. The Bible says there are public gifts and there's a private gift. And many people miss this in scripture and get confused. So understand that the public gifts are for the edification of the body of Christ, the church. While the private gift is for the edification of the individual believer. And let's talk about them. The purpose of public gifts is found in Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 4, he says, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and to another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts, and He alone decides which gift each person should have. So we see that the public gifts of the Spirit are for the edification of the body of Christ. Now, there's not one complete list in Scripture of the gifts of the Spirit like there is for the fruit of the Spirit that we find in Galatians. Spiritual gifts can be found listed in Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, and more. Some of those gifts include administration, discernment, encouragement, evangelism, faith, giving, hospitality, knowledge, leadership, prophecy, tongues and interpretation, teaching, serving, mercy, wisdom. And Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 to say, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Why? For the building of the church, for helping others, not for personal gain or recognition. And then there's the private or personal gift of the Holy Spirit. And that is for the edification of the individual. The Bible in several places calls this the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want to be clear about one very important thing. All Christians are filled with the Spirit at salvation. You receive the Spirit of God when you accept Jesus as your Savior. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we believe, is a separate and ongoing experience in the life of the believer that usually happens at a different time in your life. You might say, how do we know the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everyone? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at the word of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. As he's baptizing people prior to Jesus being revealed as the Messiah, he says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, 
so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John makes a very clear distinction between receiving the Spirit and then receiving the fire. We then see the fire associated with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2. And there's no qualifier here. John the Baptist was talking to everyone within earshot. And in the upper room, it says they all spoke in other tongues, men, women, everyone who was praying. Now let's take a minute and address one big point here because some people get all hung up on tongues. Let's just all admit that it's weird. It's not normal, it's strange. And many times I've wondered, God, why was that the sign? Why did you choose the tongue? Why didn't you pick something a little more normal? Well, when you ask God a question, you should expect an answer. And God took me to the book of James chapter three and beginning in verse six, it says, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And the Bible tells us that the tongue is the hardest part of our body to control, and we can't do it by ourselves. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So doesn't it just kind of make sense that the demonstration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit would involve the one part of our body that we can't control by ourselves? Because when we can control our tongue, we can be sure that the Holy Spirit is at work in us. Now, one more thing. Let's not make speaking in tongues the ultimate gift. In fact, the Bible never instructs us to speak in tongues. And I'm talking about our private prayer language when we come together. Our corporate meetings, our church services, are for the edification of everyone in the room. Yes, we can pray in the Spirit when we're in church, but let's not make it the gold standard of spiritual maturity, because Scripture never does that. In fact, Paul prioritizes the gift of prophecy over tongues, the use of the public gift of the Spirit for everyone's benefit. But the private gift of an unknown prayer language when the Spirit prays on your behalf with knowledge you don't have about things you don't understand or even knows what to pray when you're at a loss for words, we strongly believe that that is available to everyone. So a final thing in this introductory conversation about the Holy Spirit. Let's answer the question of how do we carry the Holy Spirit in our daily lives? How do we allow Him to be at work in us and through us to reach the world that's around us? Well, first, we carry the Spirit by seeking the work of the Spirit in our lives. You see, it's not about seeking the gifts. It's about seeking the giver of the gifts. And in the city of Corinth, it was becoming a contest to see who could demonstrate the coolest gifts. Listen, the gifts of the Spirit aren't about being cool. They're about being conformed to the image of Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And part of that work is being open to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Church, we desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives because Jesus wouldn't have sent us something we didn't need. And I love what Corey Ten Boom, the author of The Hiding Place, who barely survived a Nazi concentration camp after her family had been murdered, and what she said about the work of the Holy Spirit. She said, trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. My prayer for you is that you open yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit operating in your life. That you open yourself to the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating through your life. And that you open yourself to the baptism of the Holy Spirit empowering your life. If you wanna know more about the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let us know, and we'd be glad to have someone speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. So as you open yourself to the Holy Spirit, may you be blessed with an open heart and mind to receive all that the Holy Spirit has for you and to do everything the Holy Spirit will supernaturally empower you to do.